It is uh, six o'clock, so I think uh, we can uh, get uh, started. Uh, it is a great privilege. It gives us a uh, unique pleasure to welcome you, welcome you back uh, to Goldsmiths. And I say back uh, because uh, uh, we were again very privileged uh, uh, to award uh, an honorary uh, doctorate uh, this uh, summer. And to have you as uh, our honorary very, very special guest uh, in our inaugural graduation ceremony, the inaugural graduation ceremony of this program in uh, July. And this is the first time that we meet again since uh, then. And uh, it is again a very special occasion, on a very special occasion, uh, where we will have uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, your recently published uh, book, The Unity of Law. Um, and there will be an opportunity for, uh, I think, discounted uh, access to uh, copies of uh, the book. Uh, we will be circulating a little code, if I understand correctly, that uh, gives a, a generous discount. But we'll, we, as a department, will also order a number of copies and offer them to students as prizes when they students have engaged well or have um, achieved uh, academically in particular elements of, of the provision. We have this emerging culture of um, drawing on the wonderful intellectual uh, uh, outcomes um, of the work of visiting professors uh, uh, or other honorary uh, contributors to, to the program. And so we will be doing that uh, uh, on this occasion as, as well. Uh, let me just uh, start by introducing our very special uh, guest, Lord uh, Justice Singh. Uh, so Sarah Binder Singh was called to the bar in 1989 and was in practice at the bar from 1990 to 2011, 21 years. Uh, he was uh, elected a bencher of Lincoln Sin in 2009. And before that, from 1986 to 1988, he was a lecturer at the University of Nottingham. He was on the Attorney General's panels of Junior Counsel to the Crown from 1992 to 2002. He was also additional Junior Counsel to the Inland Revenue from 1997 to 2002. He chaired the Administrative Law Bar Association from 2006 to 2008. From 2003 to 2011, he was a Deputy High Court uh, Judge and Recorder of the Crown Court from 2004 to 2011. So you can already see the incredible range of practice and, and experience. He was appointed a High Court uh, Judge, the Queen's Bench Division, now the King's Bench Division, in October 2011. He was a presiding uh, judge of the South Eastern Circuit from 2013 to 2016 and the Administrative Court Liaison Judge for the Midland, Wales and Western Circuits during 2017. In September 2018, he was appointed President of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. He was a visiting Professor of Law at the London School of Economics from 2003 to 2009, and a visiting Fellow at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford from 2016 to 2019, and has been an Honorary Professor of Law at Nottingham University since 2007. His publications include The Future of Human Rights in the UK, which could not be more timely, if I may say so, as co-author with Sir Jack Bitson and others, uh, Human Rights Judicial Protection in the UK, which was published in 2008, and of course, The Unity of Law, which was published in 2022. He was appointed a Lord Justice of Appeal in October 2017. And I think the only thing that is missing from this profile that I found on our courts and tribunals judiciary website is the honorary doctorate that we were again so delighted to award during the summer. Yes, I think that's out of date. That <laughs> slightly out of date. Before uh, we uh, hear uh, with an introduction uh, from uh, uh, Justice Singh, uh, let me just uh, set out what the structure for today is going to be. Uh, we will hear for between 10 to 15 minutes uh, uh, from uh, uh, Justice Singh. And uh, then there will be a Q&A and conversation between the two of us. So I'll be very privileged to uh, to lead on that. And of course, then there will be ample opportunity for our audience, including all our students here, to ask uh, 
uh, questions or react uh, to some of the ideas that will have been discussed. Uh, uh, and, and let me say from the outset that I see here students from across all our years, I, I believe, including a prospective student who's now in year 13 and will be joining us, I believe, in September, but also colleagues from other uh, departments to, to whom I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful to all for your interest and engagement with our program. Uh, Lord Singh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for asking me to come and speak to you this evening. I really don't want to take very long in my introductory remarks because I hope that we can have a truly interactive session, uh, discussion between the two of us and, and Q&A afterwards with, with the entire room. Uh, I will just begin with three brief points which uh, are touched on in various places in my book, The Unity of Law. Uh, the origins of the book lie in the fact that around 18 months ago, um, it was suggested to me that people might find it interesting uh, to have in one place various lectures and articles which I've written or delivered in the last 25 years. Uh, some of them had been published previously, but many had not been. And, and uh, although I didn't put in there everything which I had done in that period, uh, because some were frankly less interesting and, 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 and often duplicated material, which does find its place in the book. Uh, what struck me, and it was an interesting process of putting it together, was that actually um, there was uh, a nice body of work, which um, when I look back on it now, actually to me seems to be a coherent uh, view about uh, our legal system. And uh, so the first topic I was going to touch on briefly is why the unity of law. And that's the title of the first lecture, which I gave about 10 years ago. And in my introduction, which was new and was, was written for the purpose of the, the, the collection, um, I made the point that what I've come to appreciate, both as an academic briefly, subsequently as a practitioner, and now as a judge, is that uh, although there are great values in specialization, undoubtedly, and I would describe myself, incidentally, not as a generalist, but as, I hope, a versatile specialist. In other words, uh, a specialist in public law in particular, uh, but with the ability to think outside the box. And that's really uh, the, the theme of the first lecture and the theme of the book more generally. Uh, what I suggest in my introduction is that we can conceive of law, both the um, learning of law and the practice of law, as arguably divisible into what I call vertical and horizontal areas. By vertical areas, I mean the traditional subjects, contract taught, trusts, and so on. In practice, you tend to find that practitioners will tell you well, I specialize in family law, or I specialize in criminal law, or I specialize in commercial law, and that's fine. But what I suggest is that there are also what I call horizontal principles of law. Uh, they are, for example, uh, EU law, which we may talk about this later. Al although the UK has now left the EU, actually there's still a vast body of what is called retained EU law. And the, the principles of EU law are also not going to be uh, shed quickly. Uh, I heard a case last week which concerns the trade and cooperation agreement, which is the post-Brexit international treaty, which governs the relationship between the UK and the EU, and it's given domestic effect by Section 29 of the European Union Future Relationship Act. So EU law, 
public international law, by way of example, human rights law, are not confined to what I call the vertical areas. So if you're a family law specialist or a criminal law specialist, my view is that you can't say to a client, I don't know anything about EU law. I don't know anything about public international law. I don't know anything about human rights law. You can't, I don't think you can say that's not my specialist area because actually it touches on what you do and your client's interests can only be well served if you do know about these sorts of things. So that, that's, that's, that's the first topic. The second topic is something again that I, I touched on in the lecture, which is the first one in the book, The Unity of Law, where I, because I was asked at that time in a university setting to set out what I thought was the value of the academic study of law. And I mentioned four points uh, at page 15 of the book. First, knowing that there is a problem and being able to identify the right questions to ask. Because in real life, clients don't bring problems which are already labeled, for example, contract and taught. The second virtue I suggested of a legal education is knowing how to go about finding the answer to the question which has been identified. Because no lawyer can know all of the law, but one of the most important transferable skills is the ability to conduct legal research. Thirdly, I suggested a good grounding in the methods of legal reasoning, in particular the interpretation of legislation and the analysis of case law. Again, it seems to me that those are transferable skills. In other words, uh, if you know how to read a statute, then in principle, that should be a transferable skill, whether your specialist area is commercial law or criminal law or whatever it may be. And similarly, in relation to how do you analyse decisions of the courts, because, of course, ours is a common law system. And so the common law is still largely uh, what governs huge tracts of the law, for example, contract law, tort law. Uh, there are statutory interventions, but the general body of law in those areas is still uh, decisions of the courts over the centuries. <laughs> and the fourth uh, suggestion I made in this lecture was an understanding of the place of law in its historical and social setting, so that a student can appreciate how we got where we are, and the way in which the law responds to social problems, whether adequately or not. And that, and that leads me on to my third and final introductory topic, which is uh, something that um, a retired judge from Australia, uh, that, from the High Court of Australia, which is, in fact, it's their highest court, uh, it's their Supreme Court, uh, Michael Kirby. Who's, who's now retired, but uh, still very active. In fact, I'm, um, he's visiting London next week. I'm hoping to meet him. And he said, law is not a value-free zone. Now, a lot of lawyers, particularly in the positivist tradition, which has been probably the dominant tradition of legal education and legal thought, in this country for several hundred years, a lot of people think that law is value free. One of the things I suggest in some of my lectures is that actually <clears throat> the most dangerous people can be the ones who think that law is value free. Uh, the judge who thinks, for example, I have no philosophy. The fact that you think that may be arguably having a philosophy. Uh, the, the great American judge, Benjamin Cardozo, talked about this, um, that, that each of us brings something to the task of adjudication. And of course, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that judges are anything other than fair and impartial. 
But uh, what Cardozo appreciated in, in his famous lectures, the nature of the judicial process, which is um, something I revisited a hundred years later, is that <clears throat> we cannot avoid having an underlying philosophy of life, even those of us to whom the names and the notions of philosophy are unknown or anathema. We, there's lots of wisdom in this, and I can't go through all the quotations, and I know you'll appreciate that. We may try to see things objectively, nevertheless, we can never see them with any eyes except our own. And he, he also said that the spirit of the age as it is revealed to each of us, is too often only the spirit of the group in which the accidents of birth or education or occupation or fellowship have given us a place. And this is, this is verging on the poetic, in my view. No effort or revolution of the mind will overthrow utterly and at all times the empire of these subconscious loyalties. And that, that understanding or insight into the, the concept of subconscious bias or the potential for subconscious bias is something that I think in many fields of human activity we have become more familiar with in the last century. And it's important for judges to understand that although, of course, we try to be objective, fair and impartial, we cannot help as human beings, but to bring uh, to the judicial function, uh, as, as Cardozo put it, uh, the empire of these subconscious loyalties. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful introduction uh, to our uh, conversation. Uh, and uh, may I start by noting um, uh, something that uh, you pointed out, uh, you explained that uh, you regard uh, the, the, the work you had already done. You said it was a nice body of, of work. Um, I would beg to differ and say it's a very significant, very timely, but not, not just nice body, body of, of work. Uh, and I would highlight the, the timeliness uh, uh, from uh, the, the perspective of uh, the significant challenges uh, that uh, we currently face as, as a society, uh, and, and not just in the UK, but, but more broadly, vis-a-vis uh, -vis our relationship uh, with international law, for instance, uh, the rule of law more and more generally. Uh, and there is a range of concrete uh, examples uh, that demonstrate uh, a willingness, uh, perhaps fueled by populist uh, ambition, uh, uh, to undermine uh, the existing uh, uh, human rights structure that, that we rely upon. And I'm not asking you to comment on, on, on any of that, uh, understanding uh, quickly uh, how controversial this area uh, can be, and, and perhaps it's a useful opportunity to to explain uh, that perhaps in, in view of your role as one of the leading members of our judiciary, but, but also generally a member of the judiciary, that you cannot comment on issues that are politically controversial or live cases for, for that matter. But I just wanted to, to highlight the timeliness of your work, um, given that there is a, such a strong uh, uh, human rights, international law, rule of law, uh, philosophical foundation that I think with no need for you to, to, to comment any further, can provide a very interesting backdrop against which current debates on this on all these matters that I uh, that, 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 that I quickly referred to uh, can be had. So from that follows on uh, a, a question uh, mm. on uh, your your passion, your interest uh, uh, for and in human rights, because it's 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 crystal clear. You know, it uh, it cuts across the book, not not just in terms of the the volume of work that relates to or is influenced uh, by human rights, but also I think in terms of the the philosophical approach that uh, you and then naturally the the, the book in its entirety uh, takes. So I'm, so I'm wondering, I want I want to trace it back. You know, perhaps uh, taking a um, a chronological uh, mm. approach, if I, if I, if I may. Um, where did this originate? Well, that's a very good question. Actually, reflecting on the course which my life has taken, uh, it predates my study of the law. Uh, 
And I can remember when I was at school, in particular in the sixth form, that from a number of directions, uh, teachers introduced me to something which I had no, never previously really encountered. Okay. Uh, and and, and in, in the interest of time, I won't bore you with all the uh, different uh, sources, but, but one I can mention, and it may be of interest to, to people still today, um, there was a, a short book published by a historian called David Thompson called Political Ideas. And we, we were doing uh, a course um, preparing us uh, to do a paper on political thought. So it was part of our historical studies, but it was particularly focused on the development of political thought historically. And one of the chapters was about Thomas Paine, and it was called The Rights of Man. And, and that was really the first time I had come across this phrase. Um, he, he called it The Rights of Man because he published that book in 1792, and it was very much a defense of the French Revolution. The French National Assembly had just enacted the, the first charter of this sort, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the citizen, of course, they would have said rights of man because it lived right along. To, in more modern parlance, we would, of course, use the phrase human rights. But in many ways, uh, that, that was my first introduction. And then, and then the second thing I did want to mention is that when I did my first law degree in this country, uh, which was at the University of Cambridge, and I mentioned this in my book, that it was a very good traditional legal education of the kind that you got, certainly at that time, in this country. It was a very good technical legal education. And that is really important because if you want to win cases, for example, you have to be really good at doing the technical law um, because the other side will be. They, they have access to the best lawyers. The, 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 the government has access to the best lawyers. Uh, the corporations have access to the best lawyers. So if you if you are going to um, succeed on behalf of your clients, you have to have a really good grounding in the technical aspects of law. But, and this may surprise you to know now, but in 1985, when I graduated, uh, there was really no course on human rights law. So certainly none that was accessible to me. And so one of the reasons I went to the University of California at Berkeley was that in America, they had already started uh, courses, uh, particularly at the LLM stage, on international human rights law. And the only book of which I was aware, which was in the English language on the subject, had been published in 1979 by two American professors, Richard Lillick and Frank Newman. And Richard Lillick was a professor at the University of Virginia, and Frank Newman was a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, I was very fortunate. I had a Harkness Fellowship, which allowed me to study at any American university that I wanted to go to. And to be honest, I fancied going to North California. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Um, and, uh, and, and I made uh, many friends there, and I, and I visit California from time to time. In fact, I'm going to be there uh, later on this year, uh, di doing a similar event to this one, actually, at uh, what I regard as my second um, second home uh, at the University of California. Um, but it was really interesting. Um, so that's, that's how the interest in human rights law began. I think it goes to show, and quite clearly, the, uh, the, the role that teachers can, mm. can play. Mm. Um, in a very positive way, one hopes most of the times, but sometimes in quite negative way too, if, if we are not careful. But uh, in your case, apparently you were, you were yes. very lucky with the, the teachers that, that pushed you in that, uh, yes. in that direction. You mentioned Berkeley uh, all, all, already, and uh, you yeah. mentioned that uh, um, in comparison somewhat to, to Cambridge, and you spoke of uh, illegal uh, technical uh, educational method uh, that uh, Cambridge uh, was, was uh, 
deploying and on all the benefits, of course, that derive from that. But then you contrasted uh, that uh, in a very useful way uh, to the social, legal, law and society approach that American yes. universities tend to take, and in particular yes. Berkeley is, uh, yes. is 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 well known for yes. for that. In in fact, we we as a program, but I think as a university too, aspire for some of our key values to reflect that uh, social legal uh, perspective that is so central to institutions like Berkeley. Yeah. So, I'd like to, to elaborate perhaps on that law and society approach has influenced you and... and uh, but not, not to a great extent because, I, because I'd like to, to, to allow the conversation to develop, um, but it's really coming back to uh, one of the points I made in my introductory remarks that, uh, as I suggest, particularly in my the second lecture, which is chapter two of this book, which I called The Law as a System of Values, um, that uh, law is not a value freezer. And one of, one of the um, sort of exercises that I think one can usefully perform is uh, to pose the counterfactual. If you go back historically uh, and look at some of the most important, the landmark cases in history uh, and ask yourself the question, what would our society have looked like? if those cases had been decided the other way. And you go back to um, what one of the foundational cases of constitutional law in 1765, which is then taken Carrington. And if, if the common law had taken the view that the government does have the power to enter your home and to rifle through your papers, because of the doctrine of state necessity, which the court rejected as a matter of common law, uh, then what kind of society would we now be? Uh, because many, many scholars certainly trace the, the modern notion of the rule of law back to the decision in Entick and Carrington in 1765. But more, much more recently, one of the earliest cases which uh, the courts had to decide in this country under the Human Rights Act uh, was in 2004, the Belmarsh case, which I talk about on many occasions throughout this book. And I should declare uh, that I was one of the counsel instructed by Liberty, uh, the, the National Council for Civil Liberties uh, in that case, uh, which was an intervener in the case. So it wasn't representing the individual detainees who, that they, they were, there were 14 people who were suspected international terrorists and after 9-11 they were detained without charge on the order of the Home Secretary at Belmarsh Prison, which is how it became known as the Belmarsh case. Now, in, uh, in due course, the Court of Appeal had decided the case against those claimants. It's a very respectable Court of Appeal, very strong Court of Appeal, which was presided over by Lord Wolfe, who was then the Lord Chief Justice. So that might have been the law. Um, as it happens, they were reversed by a majority of eight to one in the House of Lords, which was then our highest court. And the lead uh, judgment or opinion of speech, as it used to be called in those days, was given by the senior law lord of the time, Lord Bingham. In my view, incidentally, the greatest judge that this country has had in the last half century. Uh, sadly died at quite an early age, shortly after he retired, um, about 13 years ago. But, but he was the senior law lord at that time. And as you know, the House of Lords made a declaration of incompatibility, that the, the legislation under challenge in that case was incompatible with human rights, uh, which was uh, one of the earliest cases where the House of Lords did that. Now, the counterfactual I want you to think about is what if the House of Lords had upheld the Court of Appeal? What kind of society would we have been? Then? And that could, that, that could have happened. It, it, legally, the Court of Appeal had said that's the answer. Um, and if you go back to what had happened during the Second World War, uh, we know about Livingston and Anderson. Uh, one of the things that the government did during the Second World War was to detain without trial people who were uh, said to be of hostile origins and associations. And 
And frankly, it would have been regarded as absurd if you had suggested that people should be potentially detained without charge when they are UK citizens, which was ultimately the argument which succeeded in the Belmarsh case. Many lawyers would have said, that's absurd. That's what we do, when the nation is facing a national emergency, we don't lock up our own citizens. We lock up foreign nationals. That's what we do. That's what a lot of countries do. And so it wasn't a foregone conclusion that the House of Lords would decide the Belmarsh case in the way that it did. Um, we can speculate about what kind of society we would look like if the House of Lords had decided that case the other way. But what I'm suggesting is that the most difficult cases, uh, the, the cutting edge cases, are, are not, at the end of the day, uh, decided on, 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 on technical grounds. You, you, you run out of words. You know, a lot of English lawyers think that law is about parsing words, but it's about defining the meaning of words. And one of the examples I give in, in my lecture, the, the law system of values, is sometimes the words run out. The express words run out because there's a statute. It's still on the statute book, although it's a different statute from the one I, I quoted at the time of the lecture. But in the criminal justice process, in the sentencing process, there's a provision which says that a sentencing court must follow any relevant sentencing guideline unless it would be contrary to the interest of justice to do so. And if you just think about the phrase, unless it would be contrary to the interest of justice to do so, where do you find the interest of justice? You're not going to find that in an interpretation section. And so what I believe is that throughout the law, it's about principles, as Ronald Dworkin said. But, but, but my suggestion would be that it, it's actually about values, that if you dig down deep enough between, uh, below the words and even the concepts, what you find are values. In other words, what kind of society do we want to be? Uh, and and that's, that's what makes, I think, law so interesting, because as I suggest in my book, law is not a purely abstract exercise. It is about the analysis of words and concepts, but it's, it, it, they take their place and have their impact in a hugely practical context, because it affects the lives of real people. You, you asked uh, the, the what if question, what would have happened uh, had uh, the House of Lords not uh, decided the Belmars case in the way that they did. Uh, of course, we can also resonate by reflecting on what the government did yes. uh, following on uh, the decision of the House of Lords, how they have adapted, uh, but not necessarily moved away uh, from uh, the philosophy that had underpinned the introduction of, of this quite draconian uh, anti-liberal measures in the first instance. So, you know, you know much better than I do the, the the TPIMs measures that were introduced at the control orders, yeah. and then that that sparked another intervention from the courts uh, with a view to regulating that 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 space. You know, how many hours uh, can uh, have has arrest and actually um, be allowed for in the context of of a control order and so on and so forth. Also, interestingly, I think we can uh, look across the Atlantic. Uh, for uh, answers to a similar question, mm. because the U.S. Supreme Court there, for all its liberal and constitutional-based, uh, you know, jurisprudence, depending, of course, on 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 the period of time we we are looking at, uh, um, has uh, not intervened in that area in the dramatic way um, helped as it was uh, by you know advocacy like yours in in that particular case. The U.S. Supreme Court did not intervene in a similar way in relation to Guantanamo. And of course, Belmars was the Guantanamo equivalent, though smaller, but still an equivalent mm -hmm. that we had uh, that we had to to Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. That that helps is, is perhaps a good uh, um, uh, segue to the to a question about comparing and contrasting U.S. Uh, constitutional law mm -hmm. 
with, in particular, with our own public law that is that does not rest on uh, uh, on a written constitution. We we have uh, my my colleague Lena Holder who leads on public law uh, here, and I can see lots of year one students as 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 well. So you know they spend the whole year um, on constitutional law uh, in a legal system that does not have a written constitution as yes. as such, and the U.S. does. And, and you spend a lot of time in the book uh, taking examples that that provide useful contrasts in, in you know, from that perspective. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's true. Uh, several of the lectures in the book uh, are uh, looking at uh, American constitutional law in particular. Uh, it's true that, uh, as I suggest in one of them, in which I compared and contrasted the constitutions of the UK and the US, uh, which is called Divided by Common Language, which is it, it's an adaptation of a quotation from Churchill because he, he said that we're divided by a common language. Um, but I was suggesting that in, in the legal system as well, we're divided by a common language because we often use similar phrases, but they mean completely different things to people. So, for example, due process in an American constitutional law context actually has gone way beyond process. They, they have this doctrine in the 14th Amendment uh, called what they call substantive due process, which to an English lawyer seems to be a contradiction in terms. Uh, to us, you know, because we tend to take a more formalistic approach, due process, we call it the duty to act fairly or procedural fairness. It used to be called natural justice, although that's a rather old fashioned phrase now, and people aren't really sure what it means, so we tend not to use that any longer. But in American constitutional law, for the last century or more, much of the battleground has been about the doctrine of substantive due process. Uh, and and uh, initially, and, and, and this is not always appreciated in this country or outside the US, but for the first 30 years of the 20th century, <clears throat> there was a highly activist Supreme Court, which was also very conservative. Now that's, that's not a, that, that, that conjoinder between having a conservative court and an activist court is not something that people are that familiar with, uh, even in the US any longer. But what I mean by that, and this is well documented, and it was, and it was talked about at the time by not just lawyers, but by um, wider society, was that the US Supreme Court time and again struck down legislation which was designed to protect the rights of, for example, workers in factories. So the kind of legislation that we had had uh, many decades earlier, in the, in the middle of the 19th century, we had things like the Factories Act, which protected workers' uh, conditions of work. They protected workers uh, from being required to work excessive hours. Um, they, they prevented child labour, things of that sort. And... <clears throat> There was a time in the early 20th century when uh, if you wanted to, um, I remember my professor of American constitutional law telling me this at Berkeley, that if you wanted to make an American liberal really angry, uh, you would use the phrase Lochner, because Lochner versus New York in 1905 was one of these cases. That was the, the start, uh, really, of this process of striking down socially progressive legislation. Uh, by the Supreme Court. And eventually this culminated in the early years of President Roosevelt's New Deal program, when of course the country was in the Great Depression, one third of the workforce was unemployed, there was no welfare state to save people from starvation, and there was, many people think, there was a real risk of revolution in the United States, either, either a fascist revolution or a communist revolution. Uh, so democracy was under threat. And uh, what happened was that the, the Supreme Court started striking down bits of the New Deal. And uh, it became clear that this just couldn't go on. And, and uh, President Roosevelt tried to increase the number of judges on the Supreme Court in the late 30s. And that was widely regarded as a bad idea 
and many commentators think that it was one of the few political mistakes he made because people have a very strong sense that you should not pack the courts. Um, but, but eventually, partly because of retirements and deaths, uh, he had the opportunity to appoint new judges to the Supreme Court. And um, th there was a phrase that we used at the time that a switch in time saved nine, you know, because there are nine judges on the court and that because they switched their philosophy, um, they uh, were able to save the, the, the Supreme Court in a sense. Um, but if you, if you turn the clock forward about 40 years, the doctrine of substantive due process re-emerged in the 1960s and 1970s, and it, it was actually the doctrinal foundation of Roe versus Wade, because there is no express right to privacy in the uh, US Constitution. Uh, let alone, let alone an, any, any express reference to access to uh, abortion services. Uh, but the, the Supreme Court in 1973 based its decision in Roe versus Wade on uh, the doctrine of substantive due process. And of course, as is well known, last year in Dobbs, the Supreme Court reversed that decision. And I'm, I'm not going to comment on the rights and wrongs of either of those decisions. But we can see that process um, and how, yes, in a sense, it's, of course it's true that there is a text. So you have the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, but what it actually meant in practice and how it was applied in real cases depended in a very similar way to the development of the common law on a judicial interpretation and judicial development, because, because you don't find, as I say, you don't find the right to privacy in the, in the actual text of the US Constitution. I, I think that again provides an interesting segue to examine um, the multiplicity of uh, sources of law that we're currently faced with, and, and obviously the, the book being called The, the Unity of, of Law. Uh, the, the message uh, there at the center is uh, the need uh, or, or how you're calling upon uh, the legal practitioner, the legal educator, those learning the, the law uh, to be alert to that multiplicity of sources and, and to try as best uh, they can uh, to adopt a more holistic understanding of the law. And, and I would like in, in, in view of our conversation on the comparison between US law and English law, for instance, um, I was wondering whether you could reflect uh, on the unity of law from that cosmopolitan perspective. So you, you call upon us to be aware, to be alert to you know, the resources within our own domestic system of law, but then that is multiplied uh, um, if one looks at then the relationship of uh, UK law with other foreign jurisdictions. And, and here you take several examples from uh, Anglo-American and, and common law uh, systems. Um, but also beyond that, transnational law, we, we're just coming out of uh, a process that you know lasted over four decades, uh, where we were in the same laboratory of, of, of law with, with continental European law. And, and so I'm wondering, you know, in, in where we find ourselves right now, um, where you feel, um, what is the direction of, of travel in terms of, you know, working with, with this multiplicity it, of sources of law? Yeah, it's interesting. First of all, it's very difficult, I think, because of course, you know, we're all human and, and, and there are only so many hours in the day, so people can't necessarily be expected to uh, be on top of everything. And that, that would be completely unrealistic. But as I suggested in the book, that, that um, being able to do the relevant research is important. And so it's not just uh, American uh, contributions to constitutional thinking, but that, as you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, important jurisprudence in Europe itself. Interestingly, I did one of the last cases I argued as a barrister, which I think was in 2010, uh, I was appointed a High Court judge in 2011, was in the Privy Council. It was an appeal uh, from Gibraltar to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. And it was about the rights of uh, a same-sex couple be before 
there was any concept of civil partnership, let alone of marriage. And uh, the only authority that I was able to find, which was really on point, was a decision of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. And so although we were dealing with the Constitution of Gibraltar, that uh, we, we had really nothing comparable in any European jurisprudence. And in fact, if anything, the leading at that, at that time, the leading House of Lords decision was a case which I had argued in 2004 uh, in this country under the Human Rights Act called Gaydan, uh, which I think is still the leading authority on Section 3 of the Human Rights Act and the, the obligation uh, of interpretation. Um, but it, it only went so far, and arguably it actually was um, an obstacle, uh, because in Gaydan, the, the House of Lords had appeared on one reading of their decision to suggest that if Parliament had distinguished between the rights of married couples and everyone else, that that would have been all right. And that the vice that was identified in Gaydan was that Parliament had not stopped there. Parliament had in the Rent Act gone on to say that an unmarried couple did have equivalent rights to a married couple, but only if they were an opposite sex couple. And so the line became not one between marriage and everyone else, but between a same-sex partnership and uh, a heterosexual partnership. And that was the vice which was found to be incompatible with the ECHR, and that's why they ended up interpreting the Rent Act uh, in a very strong way, so that you had to read in words that it, where it says living as husband and wife, that, it, that included a same-sex Couple. And that was very important in, in its day because at that time we didn't have the Civil Partnership Act, which only came in in 2004. And of course, we didn't have the equal marriage legislation, which we had subsequently about 10 years ago. But when I, when I argued a case called Rodriguez in the, in the Privy Council, which, as I say, came out of Gibraltar, now Gibraltar's law was different from the UK's law because they gave these rights to tenants and, and the, uh, the surviving partner, if one tenant dies, only to married couples. And so it raised very starkly the question, is the state entitled to protect, as it used to be put in those days, is it, is it entitled to protect the institution of marriage? And Lady Hale had suggested in Gaydan that it was, that, that, that if that had been where the line was drawn, that that would have been acceptable. And so I lost the case in the High Court of Gibraltar. I lost the case in the Court of Appeal of Gibraltar. So here we are. We come to London and we argue the case in the highest court, which is the Privy Council. And I, I, I remember when I started my submissions, uh, Lord Phillips was in the chair, Lady Hale was sitting. And I, and I because this is the duty of the advocate, I, I acknowledged the difficulty that we faced, given that we had... Um, the authority of Gaydan possibly being against us, um, no relevant European jurisprudence, certainly nothing that helped us, and, and one decision of the South African Constitutional Court, which did help us. And uh, I, I remember I, sa I said that I recognised what had been said in Gaydan, and Lady Hale said to me, Mr Singh, that was then, and this is now, so please go ahead and make your submissions. And eventually, uh, I'm pleased to report on behalf of my clients that, that we did um, succeed in that case. But, but going back to your question, Dimitros, it was really about um, the, 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 the potential for using jurisprudence from a jurisdiction like South Africa, which, which obviously I'm not familiar with, and many lawyers in this country would not be familiar with. I think that there are interesting questions to be asked in terms of the 
the, the, the cosmopolitan legal cosmopolitan direction that we may be following post uh, Brexit. Um, I mean, will there be more scope for for us? Uh, will it become more natural for for us as a system to look? at uh, common law jurisdictions mm-hmm. in ways that we were perhaps previously yes. not so frequently doing uh, and at the same time are we going to miss out uh, from this process of uh, uh, constant interaction mm-hmm. as part of institutional structures uh, that are now have, have been operating for, for nearly 50 years um, and, and will Europe miss out on that Anglo-Saxon Anglo-American influence because they only now rely on on, on Iris, uh, on Ireland for for yes. for that uh, uh, purpose. Uh, um, but, but but the other really perhaps even more interesting uh, theme, especially for for everyone uh, here. I'm a comparative lawyer, so mm-hmm. you know the the, the the first theme was is extremely interesting to me. But I think the, the other theme uh, um, concerns uh, the the relationship between law and society. Yes. You, you do. Yes of course, explain in, in great detail how law underpins society, how law responds to, to society. Um, I, 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 if I may, I'll just read a quick excerpt from uh, your uh, book, it's in page 32, I, I think, uh, um, where you reflect on uh, what your task is mm-hmm. vis-a-vis uh, ensuring that the law is uh, reactive, responsive to Virtual needs for for change. And ultimately, the question here is uh, how quick are laws reflexes when it comes to realizing that there's a need for for change? Mm-hmm. I mean, you were just uh, giving us a, a fine illustration of an area where there was a need for change and where change indeed happened. But but then again, I'm sure you know if we go around the room or in our classrooms every day, we do locate a number of areas where we perhaps feel as learners of the law, as teachers of the law, that sometimes the law tends to be quite conservative or is not is not reacting as quickly as it should. And so you you explain, I would say that our task is to develop the common law in an incremental way so as to ensure stability in society while keeping the law in tune with the needs of a changing world. We need to apply a steady hand on the tiller with the occasional gentle nudge to make sure that the law is proceeding smoothly and not getting too close either to the bank or stuck in turbulent waters. So I was wondering whether you could yes, what, collect on that. Yes, this is the constant um, struggle of any legal system, I think, which is not to become stuck in a bygone era. Um, but at the same time, society, human beings, businesses uh, need uh, stability uh, and predictability. Uh, One of the most important functions of law is to provide the conditions in which people can plan their affairs. For example, it's conducive to investment. Uh, Businesses need to know that uh, if they enter into a contract, that it will be reasonably certain how it's interpreted uh, and and that uh, there will be independent and fair courts which will enforce their bargains. And so I don't think, for example, that it would be appropriate suddenly for a single judge or even uh, a group of judges uh, to say, well, we're going to tear up what we all have learned is the law of contract from the last 250 years. Um, Nevertheless, there may well be appropriate incremental development um, and, and so, so that's really what I was getting at in that passage. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of uh, the, the interest uh, that there will be in, in our audience uh, to, to participate. Uh, and I think we were coming to the end of that part of, of tonight uh, where I'm leading with, uh, with questions. Uh, I, I still want to take the next six minutes, if I may, okay. up to seven o'clock, of course. <laughs> to, be, to be very precise, uh, to ask a couple of uh, questions. So I'll ask them, I'll, I'll perhaps ask them together and then you decide uh, how long you may wish to dedicate to each of them. So the first thing relates to Antigone. Oh, yes. And I was obviously, you know, for... for cultural and yes. historic and yes. personal reasons uh, yes. delighted that uh, you, know, you make a number of reference to, I think you make a couple of reference to Antigone yes. and, and more generally to cl- classical uh, uh, Greek uh, doctrine. Uh, and 
and I was very privileged that I, I had the opportunity to watch it again in Epidaurus this 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 summer, which was a very unique experience. Uh, well, we haven't ventured down to you know the south of the Peloponnese with uh, our students. I, I was explaining here yes, that we, yeah. we went on the Human Rights Summer School yes. last summer, yes. but we, we might do in uh, in the near in the near future a very unique experience. Yeah, and, and I, I've been to that theatre. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, I've been to that theatre, and the acoustics are amazing. Uh, even now, my, my my recollection is that if you stand where presumably the actors would have been, and you can be in the top row uh, on those stone seats, and you can hear clearly what what the actor is saying. I, I was I was quite disappointed that it was technically enhanced this uh, this summer. Ah, really? Uh, yeah. But but the but legend has it, and and the the actual doctrine is that this was indeed the key characteristic of the Epidaurus uh, theater, uh, and it's a fifteen thousand people capacity theater yeah. as well. So right. the fact that, that it it had that uh, quality when it was so one of the yeah. largest of its time yeah. is, is very very impressive. But on on the question of of Antigone, mm -hmm. uh, you discussed this in, in the context of civil dis disobedience, yeah. and I don't know if we have the time to to explore the the detail. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we've been, it's been interesting times, as you, as, as you are also saying in your book, we, we've been faced with turbulent times in, in the UK, including uh, in relation to the very important issue of racial equality. And, and, and so I can, if I can connect it to in terms of the cost on four, but I'm not asking about that particular case. Um, I'm, I'm just asking about, uh, you know, civil disobedience, mm. uh, human rights, perhaps in the in the context of uh, yes. what you discussed uh, in the book. Uh, uh, it, it's really interesting because in fact this goes back to something that you asked me about at the beginning of our conversation, and I didn't have time to mention it then. But as well as the history teacher introducing me to Thomas Paine, I had a classics teacher who introduced us to the Antigone. And, and, and I talk about that in, in, as you say, my lecture, Antigone's Law. And, and one of the reasons why the Antigone has been so influential on me ever since is that so far as I am aware, and, and people who know more about this than I do will correct me, but so far as I'm aware, the Antigone is the first occasion we find in Western thought of the concept of a higher law, because Antigone seeks to justify her defiance of the positive law of the state by reference to a higher law. Um, but she accepts the punishment. Uh, so, and some of the, one of the points that's made um, by uh, case law on the concept of civil disobedience is that civil disobedience, as Lord Hoffman said, on conscientious grounds, has a long and honourable history in this country. Um, and, 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 and more recently, the Lord Chief Justice has said that the, the fact that people are acting uh, not, for example, for a selfish reason, um, but out of conscience, uh, is a relevant factor which needs to be taken into account in the sentencing process. So, uh, the concept of civil disobedience is recognised, and the idea that you're obeying your conscience rather than obeying the law of the state where you happen to live. Um, but, but more generally, as I suggest in that lecture, what that I think has then done is resonate down through the two and a half thousand years since, uh, through thought about uh, law and justice and and the duty to obey the law and and the way my my professor of jurisprudence when i studied that subject at cambridge put it to me and i found this mind-blowing i have to say at the time was he said you have to think about this question are there circumstances in which the law itself is unlawful and I, 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 as an undergraduate, I, I just couldn't initially, I couldn't get my mind around that. How can the law be unlawful? But there's a very interesting example, which I mentioned, and perhaps we can finish on, on this note. Um, very interesting case <clears throat> that the, the courts of this country had to decide in 1976. It's House of Lords decision called Oppenheimer and Catamol. 
And what happened there was, to, to simplify things, that there was a, a decree in 1941 of the Nazi regime in Germany, which deprived, having deprived Jewish people of their citizenship, it then deprived people who weren't citizens of their property. So you confiscate the property effectively of Jewish people. Now, in terms of what's what's called a conflict, conflict of laws problem, so if it arises an issue of law in this country, conventionally, what the English court should and would do is say, when it asks itself the question, who owns this property? It would answer that by reference to the law of the foreign state concerned. So that would have been the simple answer, that this property does not belong to these Jewish people. It belongs to the state because it has been confiscated according to the law of that state. And that consequence was regarded by the House of Lords as so repugnant that they simply were not prepared to apply the conventional doctrine. And uh, I'm just seeing if I can find the quotation from Lord Cross. Yes. It's at uh, page 52 of the book. He said, what we are concerned with here is legislation which takes away without compensation from a section of the citizen body singled out on racial grounds, all their property uh, on which the state passing the legislation can lay its hands and in addition deprives them of their citizenship. To my mind, a law of this sort constitutes so grave an infringement of human rights that the courts of this country ought to refuse to recognize it as a law at all. And that, that sort of helped me to answer um, the question which had been posed for us by our professor. Are there circumstances in which the law itself may be unlawful? Thank you so much. Um, no, not just for that final reflection as far as this part of the talk uh, is uh, concerned, but, but more generally uh, for uh, going so deeply in, in answering all, all, all these uh, questions, uh, sure. despite the fact uh, some of them were, were touching upon quite controversial uh, issues. Uh, I think we, we've come to what could be the most exciting part of, of tonight, uh, though, um, and, and so I the opportunity here for uh, uh, all our participants to react to what has been discussed so so far, or ask questions, or in other ways in, in, engage with tonight's uh, uh, event. Uh, who, who would like to? Aaron Teller and then Lena Bolter, both both again colleagues. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was late, but what I did see was fascinating. Um, my question is to pick up on, on incrementalism that you talked about, and in particular the role of judges. Uh, there, there is, I think, a, a quotation from Lord Hoffman in an unjust enrichment case where he talks about how worse the effect of once a judge has put his or her words out there, they're sort of, they're out there and it's for the next court to interpret. Yes. Uh, and, and I faintly recall there might even, for my days of the law student, there might even be a case where a judge talked about him or herself in the third person in an earlier case, yeah, saying, well, that judge said this there, yes, and it yes, And yes. Uh, <laughs> I reflect on what Amy Hale said in the, in the Privy Council case that you mentioned. Yes. Is, is that, uh, as a judge, both reflecting on your own judgments and when you're faced with earlier judgments of, of other judges, do you yes. see it as, do you see your words as being sort of out there and free to be reinterpreted? And, and is that how you approach Yes, de 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 definitely, yes. We, uh, and, I, and I've said this frequently in my own judgments, that the, the words of a judge should never be read as if they were contained in a statute. Because uh, so, there's a difference in judicial lawmaking as compared with legislative lawmaking. But... Uh, you're absolutely right uh, that once, I mean, one of the things that's frequently said, and it's true, is that judges speak through their judgments. And that's one of the reasons why it's not appropriate for us to comment 
on a judgment because the judgment says what it says. You know, any, anyone who reads the judgment of the Court of Appeal can see what it says. That's what we said. The Supreme Court said what it said. So you can read that and you can make of it what you will. Um, but you're absolutely right. In subsequent cases, it, it, one of the things that interests me is which of my previous judgments are cited and which seem to sort of die a death. <laughs> and they're not necessarily the ones that I would have predicted um, because uh, there, there are some, if I may say so, you know, very, very interesting judgments that I've given, but, but they're, never, they're never mentioned again by anyone. And, and uh, others which are, I thought, you know, sometimes they're extempore. I'm sorry to use the Latin phrase, but they're, they're unreserved judgments, which I gave uh, on the day of the trial in question. And you see them cited to you uh, in future cases. Incidentally, I'll, I'll, I'll end my answer to your question, if I may, on, on, a, on a, a lighter note. That when I first got big, appointed a high court judge, and I didn't realize that there's a certain kind of coded language which advocates use. And somebody said to me, your lordship will be very familiar with this case. And I said, really, why? And he said, well, you were in it. And apparently that's that's the code. So after that, I've never asked why are you saying I'm familiar with this? Because I think you know, we're human. We forget. <laughs> we, we forget earlier um, cases in which we appeared. Uh, we certainly, I forget cases in which I gave a judgment. I read it again, and uh, that that reads really well. I, that, <laughs> I'm quite proud of that. But I, I, I'd forgotten that I'd written it. Um, um, but uh, it, it is interesting that, uh, as you say, it, once you've said it, it's out there. And so, what people then subsequently choose to quote in later arguments isn't necessarily what you expected that they would quote. Yeah. That's, that's really... Yes, Glenn. Good um, point. I have a small comment on the last one that you mentioned that a law can never be a law for, and I think with the instrument of the Declaration of Incompatibility, we have an instrument which kind of points to the fact that some people might consider certain law unlawful and could be considered as unlawful in the future, so I found this very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, but my question was more on this uh, transition from being at the bar to a bench, um, and how we've dealt with that, um, because when you talked about the Rodriguez case, I think you really went there to stretch the boundaries of the, to push the boundaries of the law, and by then, and when you shift to the bench, I think you have another role, and have you ever been in a situation where you felt that your personal values did not align with the doctrine that you were supposed to follow, um, and how do you deal with these transitions between different hats? And yeah, it's that's, that's a very good question. Firstly, we haven't actually had that experience, and, and, and one of the reasons for that may be that actually, although, as I've said earlier, stability, uncertainty, and predictability are very important attributes of the law, that particularly perhaps when you sit at the appellate level, that, uh, the, 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 there's quite a lot of room for manoeuvre because uh, almost by definition, the cases that we're deciding, particularly in the Court of Appeal, and it would be even truer in the Supreme Court, uh, they're, they're not cases where the answer is going to be clear on the basis of decided authority. And so, although the doctrine of precedent is important, uh, we, we, if there was a binding precedent on the point, then frankly, the case wouldn't be in front of us because the parties would settle it. So uh, much of the work that we do in practice, uh, it, it, it's not necessarily the case that you uh, are bound to a particular outcome. But that said, one of the things I say in the book, particularly when I'm uh, referring to Cardoso, is, and, I, and it may be helpful if I, if I go back to that, to remind myself of, of what Cardoso said about this, that um, it, it, what would not be right 
particularly in a democratic society governed by the rule of law, is for an individual judge simply to impose their subjective values on society. So, so at least that's what I believe I'm not doing. Uh, and, and Cardoso said that the judge uh, is still not wholly free. Uh, he is not to innovate at pleasure. He is not a knight errant roaming at will in pursuit of his own ideal of beauty or of goodness. Uh, he is to draw uh, his inspiration from consecrated principles. So, and, and I think, um, although the language is obviously very dated now, but I think that uh, the fundamental point he's making, which uh, is that you're, you're developing the law, but not with a blank sheet of paper. So you're not a legislator, for example. Um, you're, you're, you're developing the law within the context of well-established principles. Um, so so I don't, the answer to your question, it, which is a very good question, if I may say so, is that I haven't actually found in practice uh, the, the difficulty to which you referred. Thank you, Lena. Yes. Uh, so you, thank you so much, first of all. I got so much perspective out of this talk, so that was really helpful to me. My question relates to your observations of how the law is not completely value free. And uh, you alluded to the fact that there can also be plural values. Um, and I suppose my question is that does the law navigate and negotiate between different values? And if so, how does or should it navigate the value pluralism? Yes, again, it's a very good question. And I, and I tried to address that in my lecture, Law as a System of Values. And, and, and really going back to the previous question, what, what I suggested in that talk was that the judge is not free simply to draw on their own subjective values and say, well, I think this is what a good society would look like. So this is what I'm going to impose on our society. But what I suggest is that you, you look into the fundamentals of your own legal system. And, and I suggest that within certainly our legal system, there are certain bedrock principles and bedrock values. Uh, they, they inevitably, they're probably going to be phrased at a very high level of abstraction. So, but it's, but it's bedrock values like the rule of law, equality, fairness. But th those actually take you quite a long way <laughs> because um, that those are inherent values within our legal system. Um, it was very interesting. See, I, I, as a child growing up in this country, I lived uh, through the period when almost daily on, on the television news, we would hear about a bomb that had gone off. Often in Northern Ireland, sometimes in other parts of the UK. Um, I remember when I was just beginning in practice, I used to travel a lot on trains because I would, I would appear in magistrates courts in uh, all small parts of the country and, 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 and travel around by train a lot. And there was a bomb attack on Victoria Station here in London. And uh, fortunately, I, w I wasn't um, at Victoria Station that morning. But one of my colleagues from law school was and he was badly injured and he lost one of his eyes in that attack and and so the, the time that i grew up in was one when people were frankly frightened and and, and there was a, a real issue about political violence having an impact on people's lives and obviously more recently We've had things like 7-7 uh, in 2005, when many people lost their lives and others were badly injured in attacks in London. But what was interesting 
from a legal perspective about the way in which the law responded to the problem of political violence, particularly related to Northern Ireland, was that with some exceptions, the, the response of the law was to put people on trial and to give them due process. In other words, to try to convict them through a normal court process, uh, rather than, for example, martial law uh, or uh, detention without trial. Now, I did say there was, there was an exception, and there was a major exception. In 1971, uh, for a period, they did try internment in, in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, in, in other words, detention without charge. Uh, and that was then the subject of legal proceedings. Uh, eventually, a, an interstate case brought by the Republic of Ireland called Ireland against the United Kingdom later on in the 1970s. Um, was there another hand there? Yes, 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 Zach. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, some of what you said made me think of an essay that we just had on whether it's like the interaction of Section 3 of the Human Rights Act and parliamentary sovereignty. So I was just wondering how, like, personally, you kind of respond to the idea that a broad interpretation or a values-based interpretation, or that would encroach on space that parliamentary and judges shouldn't necessarily be, like, what your personal kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, well, in a sense, that's, um, that's the perennial question. And, and that is uh, the question which is rightly uh, addressed implicitly by everyone uh, in everything that they do. Um, in, in a sense, it's not for me to comment. I, I, I don't want to mark my own homework. Um, <laughs> it's not for me to comment. You know, one of the things I was saying to, uh, earlier before we started the formal uh, session was that, as I've said, judges speak through their judgments. And, and then they're out there. And they, they can be the subject of critique, if, if appropriate, they can be the subject of criticism. One of the things I've said is that we, we, we live in a free and democratic society in which anyone who holds power is properly accountable, and, and that includes accountability to the public. Uh, so, for example, uh, people can criticise, sometimes they can criticise robustly. I, I have no difficulty with that, I've, I've upheld the right of people to criticise judges in my judgments. Uh, but, but what you touch on is a fundamental and perennial question. Um, and and, it, and it, it features so much in different parts of my book. I, I, I explore the question of what is a democratic society, for example, which was the title of a lecture I gave in Canada uh, about five years ago. So. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me if I don't give you, you know, a pithy answer uh, now. But that is the, the, a fine line. Uh, you constantly have to uh, be self-aware. And, uh, and as I've suggested a number of times this evening, it's, uh, a democratic society is extremely important. It, it's important to the scheme, for example, of the human rights sector. It talks about, when it talks about various exceptions being acceptable, it always talks about necessary in a democratic society. So the value of a democratic society is hugely important. And one of the things that you will find in judgments of mine as well as of other judges is the importance of respecting the decisions of democratic institutions. Um, but you will also find uh, judgments of many judges, including me, Lady Hale, uh, in particular, in a, in, a, in a sentence which I regard as possibly the most important sentence that any judge has uttered in recent times. I quote it many times in the book. It's the end of paragraph 132 of her judgment in Gaeda, when she said that democracy values everyone equally even if the majority does not. And, and, and I'm sure people have written PhD dissertations on that, but that one sentence, in, in some ways, it encapsulates 2,000 years of thinking about this perennial question. So, so 
the answer to your question, I think, is that democracy is hugely important. We're fortunate to live in a democratic society, and I and I uh, frankly don't want to live in a society where uh, the institutions of democracy are wrongly encroached upon by people who are not elected. But on the other hand, as we've seen in a number of the examples that we've been talking about this evening, uh, if you had, for example, uh, a gross violation of the right to racial equality, in a sense, the Belmarsh case is an example of that discrimination, uh, because the House of Lords had the power to make a declaration of incompatibility, it was able to say, without striking down Parliament's Act, it was still able to say, we understand the difficulty the state finds itself in after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. We understand the need for emergency powers. But this is a line which, even in a well, especially in a democracy, must not be crossed. Because as I say, um, Lady Hale said, democracy values everyone equally, even if the majority does not. Can we finish on uh, diversity mm. or, or the lack uh, thereof in, in the judiciary? And, and you reminded us uh, at the graduation ceremony in July uh, that um, you are only one of 36 uh, judges at the Court of Appeal uh, who has an ethnic uh, minority background. How can we change that and how long will it take us? Well, very good question. Again, one that many people have been grappling with for many years. Uh, I think that it would be fair to say that I am by, by, I am by nature a person who regards a glass as half full rather than half empty. So the good news is that when I was in practice at the beginning of this century, uh, there had never been a high court judge uh, from a black or uh, other ethnic minority. Uh, in 2004, uh, the first high court judge was appointed, and that was uh, Dame Linda Dobbs, who's subsequently retired, um, but I knew well, and, and uh, everyone had huge uh, admiration and respect for her. Um, so she was the first uh, in 2004. I was the second in 2011. And then briefly, when Linda retired in 2013, I was briefly for two years the only person in the High Court uh, from a visible ethnic minority. And then subsequently, uh, I think it's four judges who have been appointed to the High Court. Uh, and obviously in the meantime, in 2017, I went to the Court of Appeal. Uh, so in the senior judiciary, and that, that's a phrase that's used in statute, incidentally, it, it talks about the senior judiciary, by which it means High Court or above. Um, that's, that's definitely progress since the beginning of this century. Uh, it, it, it's clearly only work in progress. One of the things that concerns many people is that although there are now uh, a number of High Court judges of Asian heritage, uh, since Linda retired, uh, there are no black judges at all in the High Court. Well, with a glass uh, half full perspective, perhaps we can add uh, to that, that in the um in the English legal system, there seems to have uh, been a better realization of uh, the gap that uh, we're faced with in the first instance, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the incremental progress that uh, you have elaborated upon vis-a-vis yes. uh, -vis our European partners, yes. uh, for instance, uh, yes. even at uh, the European Court of Human Rights, where we, we had the privilege to, to be last week with a couple of students that I can see in the, in the room. Yes. And it was an all white uh, yes. court uh, yes. with a few women. It was International Women's Day yesterday. Yes. And, and of course, um, 
equally disturbing and complex questions um, pertain to gender equality. Yes. Uh, we were at the Supreme Court this Tuesday. Um, of course, the, I think the, the Supreme Court in its majority is in Manchester this week. Yes. We, we still uh, follow the hearing at, at panel one. And of course, it was, it was all male. There were five uh, middle-aged, if not a little bit, uh, older, yes. white, uh, white male judges. Uh, and uh, it's it's quite difficult to explain that yes. to your yes. students or to empathize yes. with that, yes. especially when uh, you know the vast majority of our students now are female. Yes, absolutely, yes. Before I ask everyone to, to join me in uh, appropriately thanking uh, Sarah Binder, can I, can I just say that I, I, I do understand the time uh, is, is, has passed, it's 20 to 8 now, but uh, please join us for at least you know, the next 20 minutes, up to 8. Uh, there is uh, an informal uh, drinks, soft drinks uh, um, uh, reception. So um, on, on that note, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. It was, it was so insightful. Uh, we were incredibly privileged to have you, thank you with us. And we already look for the next opportunity, perhaps once you're back from the United States and all the other exciting destinations where your book will, uh, will travel. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you.